Okay, so we're holding chapter 6 in the Sefer Atanya. For those of you who missed out the first chapters, you can see it online. But I'll also give a brief introduction. Perek Vav is a very significant Perek because it presents us the two opposite sides of this world. This world actually has two opposite sides. You know, you must be thinking four sides, north, west, south, east. There's actually two. There is either the Kedusha or the Tumah. Either there's holiness or there's impurity. As I mentioned in various lectures, this creation is about pairs. There's a lot of pairs. There's Yom Valayla, day and night. There's Zachar Venekevan, male and female. We have two eyes, two feet, two hands. It's interesting, right? Everything's about pairs. And as we will see, the Balatanya explains, Zele Umadze Asa Kadosh Baruch Hu. Kadosh Baruch Hu, in creating the world, has made or has designed this world to have two completely opposite sides because they point in two opposite directions. In order to enable free will, you have to have two opposites. You have to have two forces that are equal in power. Nonetheless, only one of them is the Ikan, only one of them is really the main one. But in order to balance out the powers, the forces, Kadoshmo created them equal. So there's a lot of pairs in creation which does not necessarily mean that each one represents the opposite of the other necessarily. Even though they say men and women are opposites. But it's not exactly so because in dealing with men and women, it's more two opposites that are in need of each other. They complement each other. Whereas we will be talking about two opposites that are not really in need of each other, they are in need for the creation. In other words, Hashem made the two for a purpose. It does not mean, however, that the two can, can get along together and they definitely do not complement each other. So there are various types of opposites in this world and they represent different things. The day and night represents also different ideas, uh, very symbolic in nature. It's not just a matter of day and night, of going to sleep and going to work. It's a lot more than that. However, tonight, is more about the neshama. The neshama, as we know it, is the spiritual part of the human being. The human being also is composed of two, the physical body and the spiritual. So there is physicality in this physical world, but there's also a dimension of spirituality, which not everybody can see. But even though we cannot see certain things, we can definitely detect them. And the Baratanya goes into a little bit on how one can detect or how one can see where that which is spiritual expresses itself. This is after all a world where Hashem is concealed. And if we say Hashem is concealed, we also mean that that which is holy and comes from Him is somewhat concealed. And part of the job of the Jew, part of his mission, is to reveal it. To reveal it and to live by it. However, this is not so simple. As I've explained in other lectures, especially in the lecture, if you recall, the anatomy of the human spirit, how the human being is continuously challenged, he's being forced, he's being pulled uh, like a magnet in the various directions of this physical world. Directions, I mean, there's a lot of things that tempt him, that pull him and want his attention. So the human being can easily lose focus of what he needs to do here, what he is he for, why did Hashem create him, where is Hashem? Well, he can easily lose focus, there are many things to distract him. So what this chapter does, as well as the whole book, Balatanya, is to help us gain back our focus, to put on the glasses and realize, oh, we did not have 20-20 vision after all. Things are so blurry. And without learning the Tanya, without learning Bechlal, the Torah, it is very difficult for one to focus. It doesn't mean it's impossible for one to realize some of these things. The human being is endowed with a soul. The soul is part of God. It's divine. It has the ability to reveal some of its, of its strength in the human being. We do have a conscience, and that conscience sometimes tells us right from wrong, but we're biased. And we don't like to pay attention to the conscience. So it is possible, but the Balatanya in the Kabbalah, in general, do enlighten us 
in an area that very few people are familiar with, and that is the area of spirituality. So just to recap a little bit of what he said in the, fast, in the past few chapters, the Nefesh Eloki, this divine soul, is encompassed or consists of the ten sefirot, the ten emanations of God. Just to make it simple, encompassed means that everything in this world comes about through the ten emanations of, of God, which is a method where God interacts with this world. In other words, even though God is everywhere, He's not just somewhere up there removed from this world, He actually interacts with this world. Judaism very much believes in Hashgahat Hashem, the imminence of God in this world, His connection to this world. He supervises, He's involved, He cares about what's going on, He didn't just create the world. So when speaking about the Sefirot, even though we don't fully understand what they're all about, we call them His Midot. His Midot means His character. Hashem is not physical, he doesn't have character like we do, but he interacts with this world in various ways, various methods. So I call it Hashem's interaction in the way he expresses himself in this world. So this nefesh, this neshama, consists of all those midot. The way it connects to Hashem is also in a very, very powerful way, as we will see. I will repeat it again. The Torah and mitzvot serve as a way where one can connect, even in this physical world, to that which is divine, which is in a totally different dimension. Because the physical world is easy to connect to. Two people shake hands. That's a, that's a connection. But the strongest connection is not that which is physical. It's, it's when pe two people think alike. The mind is more powerful than anything else when people think alike. So when we do Hashem's will, when a Jew observes the mitzvot and he learns Torah, he's actually connecting with Hashem. So in the same way that Hashem connects with us through the sefirot in, in this world, we connect to Him. So this nefesh, even though there's neshama and there's ruach and there's nefesh, let's just focus on the word nefesh, this spirit. But let's call it right now the divine spirit because we will differentiate between that and the animal spirit. So this divine spirit Kalul is composed of the Eser Sefirot, which is all part of Hashem's interaction in this world, of which three are Sikhlim and seven are Rikshim. Three are more mental, intellectual, and seven are more emotional. Remember the mental ones, Chokhmah, Binah, Vadat? That's the intellect. Then you have the bottom seven Sefirot that are somewhat more expressive of the emotions. So this neshama can dress itself with levushim. What are the garments of the neshama? Machshava, dibur, and maaseh. Machshava is thought, speech, and deed. Modes of expression, which the Kabbalah calls levushim, they're garments. Why are they garments? Because we actually dress our neshama with them. The neshama, by involving itself with certain deeds, good or bad, as we will see, dresses itself up. We came here for a purpose. We came here to perform something. And through the performance of good deeds, we acquire spiritual garments, which is a tremendous light that shows itself much more in the, in the afterlife. But even in this life, when a Jew performs certain deeds, if those people who would be able to see this light, I mean, it would be noticeable. Not everyone is capable of seeing this light, but there's definitely a light that radiates from that which is holy. And there's a, something that is detectable as well if somebody commits a sin, something that belongs to the impure camp. But anyway, the machshavat dibure maaseh act as garments with which the neshama dresses itself up, and that is how it gains the reward into the world to come, through these levushim, through these garments. We call these garments because the neshama definitely looks better, is loftier, is elevated through these garments. Just like a garment makes you look good, a nice suit, tuxedo, right? Mm -hmm. And for the women, I'm sure you always look out for yourself, what you wear. Same thing, 
a man is identified through his levushim, not physical levushim, because if you look at somebody's suit, he may be rotten inside, and the garment is deceiving, because those garments conceal the, the inside, not these garments. These garments actually make you who you are. As we explained last week, when it comes to Torah, it becomes part of you. It's not only a garment that envelops you, and you envelop it through your mind when you understand something, it actually penetrates you, it transforms you, and elevates you. So this is the way a Jew can grow spiritually. Physically, approximately at the age of 18, 19, 20, we stop growing. Whether it's 5'9", 5'10", 6, 6, 6, right? You stop. You don't grow forever. But spiritually, you can continue to grow. How? Through the Levushim. So those garments enable one to elevate himself. The, I'm talking about right now the positive garments. But, as we began to say, there is an other side. And the other side is represented by the Nefesh Abehemi. The Nefesh Abehemi, the animal spirit, also has ten sefirot. Remember, everything that comes down from Hashem is pretty much the same. Hashem created a counterforce, and it has to be equal, it has to be fair. It also has ten sefirot, three of which are sikhli, intellectual, and seven which are midot. In other words, it has the same kind of a division. However, the essence of this animal spirit is klipa. Klipa means a shell. A shell covers, like the shell of a fruit, of a, of a nut. It covers, it conceals. And because it conceals, you don't get to really see the inside, what it's all about. So that's part of the definition of klipa. It's a shell. A shell also means something which is insignificant in comparison to what's really inside. So there are various definitions of klipa. But for what we need to know right now is that this klipa, even though it's created by Hashem as well, all it is is a shell. It is not as real as the essence of creation, the essence of creation being the emanation of Hashem, of the divine light, the Or and Sof in this world, that is the Ikara. But you have Klipot, you have impurities. Impurities like in wine, you know, they sing to the bottom. There are impurities, and they're called Sitra Hara, the other side, Klipot, Tmeot, unclean or impure, shells, various names. So they consist or they are formed from ten sefirot, or kitarim, crowns of Tum'ah. In the same way that the Kedusha has that, so does the Tum'ah, the impure side. So, therefore, the sefirot and the levushim that it has are also from the Tum'ah. Any garments that this side has also belongs to the Tum'ah. Whoever, therefore, dresses up with the levushim of the Tum'ah, with the impure garments, can go actually down further and further and become more and more Tameh. How could that be? Because remember, and I'm going to review it a little bit more later, there's two kinds of Klipot. There is the Klipat Noga, which we'll talk a little bit more now, we'll elaborate a little bit more this time. And there is the Klipot Atmeot Haraot. There is something called Klipat Noga, which is half bad, half good. It reminds me of the milk, half and half. You know, it's semi-good. And then you have the real bad ones, the other extreme. Now, some people do not understand what I mean by good and bad. And, you know, when we talk about good, really, good is relative. What's good for me may be not good for you. I, I like this, you may not like it. As they say in Hebrew, when it comes to certain uh, foods and tastes, everybody has an opinion. So what is good? When we say something is good, we talk about what Hashem says is good. At the very beginning of creation, after everything He created, He says, you know what, this is good. Why is Hashem telling this to us? Because it's purposeful. It serves the purpose of creation. Yes, even cockroaches are good. I know you get scared from them, <laughs> right? You don't like to see them, but they serve a purpose. Otherwise, He wouldn't make them. Even David Melech was wondering, why did Hashem make spiders? Remember that story? Until he found out, <laughs> right? He saved his life, yeah. 
anything that serves the purpose is good. So what's ra? Anything that does not serve the purpose, that opposes the purpose. So when we say something is ra, it's evil, it's bad. What we really mean is something that opposes Hashem's divine plan. Yes, He created it. We need it in this world to allow for free will. Only to allow for free will. Does Hashem want it? No, He'd rather not have to do with it. He'd rather that there be no evil in the world. When Mashiach comes, all the evil will cease to exist. In the meantime, we have to live with it. So it is possible for a nefesh that comes from Klipat Noga, which is a nefesh abehemi, the animal spirit, which is semi-good. What does semi-good mean? It sometimes does good things, it can do good things, but it sometimes can do the wrong things. Because it's a behemi, it's animalistic, it's not as divine. It's all from Shabbat, of course, it's all from Hashem. But it, because it's connected or closer to the blood, it's what makes life. It's what, it's what allows the heart to pump blood. It is in the blood, the nefesh abehemi. So this klipat noga, which not everyone has, you know, we spoke a little bit about the difference between the Jewish nation versus the other nations. He gets into a little, a little bit more in this chapter. But let's just say that the nefesh that comes from klipat noga that some individuals have is semi-good, semi-bad. It can sometimes do good. It has the potential for good, but it also has the potential to do the wrong things. So this nefesh, if it dresses up how does it dress up? By doing certain things, by activities that are against the purpose of creation, it actually lowers the status of the neshama, of this, of this nefesh. So the nefesh that is semi-good can become worse, can deteriorate. A human being can be born and can be okay at the age of 10, at the age of 20, at the age of 30, and later on in his life, he really turns away and becomes more of an animal. This can happen. That's what he's talking about, is that the levushim that come from the Tum'ah, what are levushim that come from the Tum'ah, he's going to explain. All the sinful acts, or for a Jew, even that which is forbidden for us to eat. If we eat them, or we dress up with certain activities, then that lowers the nefesh of Be'emi. And what happens when a nefesh is lowered? It is, becomes more distant. Remember, chata'in sins means that a Jew or an angel has become distant from Hashem. That's for the most part what it means. It's not necessarily an open rebellion against God. It is an act of rebellion. It's more of an act of contempt and disrespect, but there's a lot of people who are ignorant. So that's why I'm not saying it's an open act of rebellion when something is intentionally done wrong. People make mistakes too. That is why Teshuvah is something so imperative, something so essential. Something that we, we can't live without. Hashem is kind and merciful and gives us a chance to return to Him, to get close to Him. We can do that all the time through prayer. But you, you can't pray and commit a sinful act at the same time, otherwise you don't get anywhere. So therefore, through the good levushim, through the good garments, the positive garments, we can connect to Hashem in a powerful way, or chas v'shalom, God forbid, we can turn away and become more distant from him through the unclean garments that the, the nefesh behemi, not the neshama tehora, not the nefesh ha'eloki, the divine spirit is completely pure, has no interest in this physical world. It's, it's simply the captain of the ship, and in some ways I call it that it's in a cage. It cannot always express itself. We're in a physical world, we have a nefesh behemi, animal spirit, and poor nefesh eloki sitting in this cage, in this physical world, that it doesn't really belong here, it wants to be there. But it's the captain of the ship, it's the one that makes the ultimate decision. You know, and even though the nefesh abeemi has decisions too, but it doesn't always use its sechel. That's the problem, we will talk a little bit about that too. That's the difference between using our sechel and using just that behemiyut in the lower seven sefirot the lower seven midot. In other words, how do we interact with this world? Do we ponder the creation? Do we think about God or not? This will make a world of a difference, whether one is Jewish or not. Because remember, we said that there are sparks of holiness everywhere. Even if one is not Jewish, he can connect, he can relate to Hashem. In a different way, we have the mitzvot in the Torah, which help us. It's a big help, by the way. 
On the other hand, even without that, there are ways to connect. But, as the rabbis tell us, that the odds are against the average human being, the odds are against him, that he will always do the right thing. There are so many temptations. This is a physical world, people want to enjoy it. They say life is short. <laughs> enjoy it. And some people say, you only live once, even though they're wrong. There's something called reincarnation. But still, there's so many things that go on in life that people simply are distracted. They forget about what they're here. They don't even think about the question, why was I created? Why was I born? Because my parents brought me into this world. They don't think about it. But this is what happens. These are the consequences. The, 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 for every action, there are consequences either positive or negative. And that is why the levushim are so important, because the levushim, the garments that we put on, the deeds that we perform, good or bad, will determine if we are elevated or chazvashram, we go lower and lower. And the, the lower a person goes, obviously, it will be more difficult for him to get out of where he is, but it's not impossible. It just, it's just a consequence of one's actions. Just like people drift apart, they are upset at each other, betrayed each other, they drift. They don't want to be friends anymore. Can, is it possible that they will ever be friends? Yes, but it's very difficult. People drift apart. Men and women, husband and wife, can sometimes drift apart. And that's what happens to the Jew when he commits a sin, a wrong. He drifts apart. A non-Jew, however, because his purpose here is different than the Jew, he is more limited to what he can do. He can also drift apart, he can also do the wrong things or the right things, but in a more limited way. A Jew, because of the various obligations he has, the many duties and responsibilities he has, he can sometimes do certain things right and certain things wrong. One way to understand that is through electricity. You know, you sometimes have a short, a ketzer, but it doesn't mean the whole house is without light. It just means one area of the home is out, is extinguished. That's how it is with the Jews. Sometimes the whole house is lit. Part of the house is not lit. Part of him is not doing the right thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different than when you're dealing with the non-Jewish world. It's either yes or no. It's either everything is on or everything is off. Even though it's possible, even in the non-Jewish world, that a person will have a mixture of good and bad too, only because of what are we saying right now, that klipat noga, which exists to a certain extent, even in the non-Jewish uh, nefesh, can sometimes be partially good and partially bad. It's just the, the mechanism of what one does or does not do is different for a Jew and non-Jew. A Jew has mitzvot, that if he does not do positive ones, he's lacking. Something is missing. The light is not shiny. Maybe the bulb is out. Maybe it's weak. The battery is no good. Whereas in the non-Jewish world, either it's on or it's off. He does not have all the mitzvot. It doesn't mean that he's missing something in the same way that a Jew is missing something. Either he chooses to surrender, as we will see. That's the, one of the key concepts in this chapter is surrendering. Either he chooses to surrender to Hashem or not. To be independent and to not be connected to Hashem. That's pretty much the choice where with the Jew. You see how it's different? There is a certain possibility of him surrendering to an extent, even though it's not 100% pure and strong the way it should be. We have 613 mitzvot. Not everybody is strong in every area. In the end, however, Jew or non-Jew, what will determine whether they succeed or not is the levushim. Did they put on garments of purity or did they put on garments of tum'ah, of impurity? When a baby is born, you don't know. He may be cute, cutie pie, but this cutie pie may become a monster one of these days. Yeah, a lot of reshaim, evil people, when they were babies, they were cute. What will determine what he will make of himself, his ma'asim, his deeds? Jew and non Jew deeds. The deeds are the levushim. And those levushim come about through machshava dibur maaseh. Through our thoughts, through our speech, and through deeds. These are the three manifestations or three modes of expression that a human being has. He's endowed with these abilities. Animals don't have that. 
they have a different purpose. So when one dresses himself up with Torah and mitzvot, he's putting on those garments in his thoughts, in his speech, and his masim, depending on what mitzvah we're talking about. Klipat Noga is therefore an animal spirit that contains some good and some bad. Why is it called Noga? So I didn't really explain when we first started to, to talk about Klipat Noga, I didn't really explain what Noga is because we don't really know what it represents, why the word Noga was chosen. We know Noga has to do with light. It has to do with something shining. It is a Hebrew word. It is a word that exists in Lashon HaKodesh. But why call it Noga? I, in the past, I've given a, a lecture about linguistics and how in Lashon HaKodesh, in the Hebrew language, you can see from a word its meaning even without ever learning what, it, what the word means, without ever translating, but looking at the letters, what the word is composed of. Usually, a root of a word contains three letters. So if you know what every letter represents, the koach, the power that it has, you can figure out what this word is, what it is doing. Why is an elephant called a pil in Hebrew? Why is maim, what are called maim? So if you look at the letters, you can figure this out. And there's a whole lecture about it. It's online, too, if you want to see it. Three lectures about the, about the Hebrew language, the holy language. So Noga, I, I decided this time to take a look at the word Noga. I never did it before. So you know, let me know, let me figure out what, what, why Noga. <clears throat> Nun, <clears throat> especially in the first position, it's the first letter of the word, so it's very important because it tells us a little bit about the identity of what's going on. The second letter is also the pe'ilut, what is happening to that identity. And the last letter also part of its essence. In other words, what, where, and how, approximately. Nun represents a falling, like nofel. When you see the letter Nun, especially in first position, it's that something is being diminished, something is being lessened, something is falling. It's all the same idea, right? To fall, to lessen, to diminish. Nofel, that's what the word nofel means. That's why nofel is with a Nun. Okay? Any word that you see the Nun, especially in the first position, you will see something in common, something about it that is falling, detached, Less, okay? Gimel, Gimel represents Gadol. Gag, Gag is a roof. Gadol is big, right? Gal, a wave. Whenever you see the Gimel, especially as the first letter, it tells us something about big or growth or elevating. Something associated with that which, which is grand, which is, which is big. Okay, and then we have hay. What's hay? There are not too many words that begin with a hay. Hashem. No, no, Hashem doesn't begin with a hay. Hashem begins with a yud, depending which name it is. Can you think of a word with hay that begins with hay? Habet. Hmm? Habet. Habata. Head. Echo. Or habet. What is that? Chazak. Chazak is het. Oh, het. Yeah. So he represents haba'a. Haba'a means external. It means to expose, to reveal. Haba'a. Haba'a, or head, that which is exposed or revealed, or habet, that which is seen. The he is something that is expressed externally and revealed. Let's just say that. Okay, so I look at the word Noga and I say to myself, okay, what we have here is a diminished light of Hashem. The He represents Hashem. The He represents something which is being revealed. A light. That, what, what is being revealed? A light. We're talking about a, a, a form of light. Spiritual light. And the Nun means that something is being diminished here being diminished to a gimel, that which is great, the or and sof. The or and sof, the Kabbalah teaches, has gone through many tzimtzumim, constrictions, to come down to his physical world. We don't see Hashem in his grand way, even though we can see 
signs of him, but it's so much mitzumtzam, it's constricted. So here you have Noga, which is really not a very, very big light. It's just a Noga, a shine, a blimp on the radar. Right? But it shines. It's a light. That's the hay of the light. What is happening to this light? It's diminished. It's very, very small. It's noon. The noon is happening to the gimel, to this big thing. What is this big thing? The hay, the light. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? This is my way of understanding, my interpretation of why Noga is called Noga. All right? So I think it's interesting. A diminished light or a constricted light. But what about the lower clipot? The lower clipot are worse. They're completely bad. The three lower clipot are totally bad. Okay, fine. Now what? Well, we are told that anything that nourishes gets power from these clipot. For the most part, it is not serving the Kedusha. It is not serving the purpose of Hashem. Anything that derives its power nourishes from these klipot, basically, for the most part, does not serve the purpose of Hashem. I said for the most part because you can have unclean animals that serve some purpose. A donkey is unclean and serves a purpose. It can help us. So that's why I said for the most part, not all. For the most part, anything that nourishes from these klipot, the real bad ones, the three bad ones, doesn't serve the purpose of the Kedusha. In other words, does not assist the Kedusha. And therefore, it in itself can never transform itself, it can never elevate itself. It will always remain Tameh. Non-Jews who converted genuinely, it's because of the holy sparks in them that enables them to come out of it and to want to connect to Hashem. They are divine. There's something that's drawing them. If they're genuine, they want it. Most of the world does not want it. Otherwise, you have millions of Chinese or millions of whatever other nation in line at the Israeli rabbinate wanting to convert. They're not. You see what I mean? But many will want to when Mashiach comes. When things become a lot clearer and the Tuha is really dead, everybody will be drawn to it. At that point, of course, it's too late. You can't change sides then, even though you are welcome. You will be welcome if one at least fulfilled the seven Noahide laws, he definitely has a share to the world to come. He did his job in a limited way. That's always a, But anybody that was completely away cannot join the club and cannot have that share to the world to come. So you can see, just look at the world. How many want to convert? Not converted because they want a green card. Not converted because they want to get married to someone Jewish. Not converted because of some interest. Genuinely wanting this, not that many. Never. Throughout the history, there have been. These are divine sparks. Let's just call it that way. So included in this side that we're calling Tameh, impure, the three bad klipot, is everything that is forbidden for the Jew, whether it's Averot, negative commandments, or that which is forbidden for us to eat. And when we say that which is forbidden to us to eat, we're including that which is Tzomeach, that which is part of the vegetable world, like orla, mm -hmm. the fruit of the tree during the first three years. It's forbidden. Okay, you understand what I mean, therefore? Anything that is forbidden for the Jew, anything which is forbidden for us to eat, belongs to that side. So if you ever wonder, why can't I eat zebra? Such a cute animal. Stripes, you know, maybe it would be even tasty. It's not because it's unhealthy. It has nothing to do with that. The Torah did not say don't eat these foods because they're unhealthy for you. The Torah says because they are Tameh. Mm -hmm. And the Zohar further elaborates that they belong to that side. Without getting into it, what does it mean belong? Why, do the, why does the zebra belong there? Why, why can't the zebra belong with the goats and sheep? We don't have time to get into that right now. Okay, Another time perhaps We'll talk about that. It's an interesting topic, by the way. Yeah. Right? But just remember one thing, if you're really curious about it, is that that which is clean 
is usually not a carnivore. Okay, it, it's 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 its whole habit, its whole existence is much purer. Certain fish, the ones with scales and fins. Just think about that. There's a lot more purity to those animals that are clean than the ones that are not clean. That's the, that's all. So anything that's forbidden for the Jew, therefore belongs to that side. However, Hashem did say, Zele umatze, I did create the two sides, and therefore, I want them. I want to have both sides. In other words, those animals that are unclean and are not therefore useful to us, we're not allowed to eat, consume them, are still necessary. In other words, don't get me wrong. Everything that Hashem made, Zele umatze, means that he wants to have the two sides, the two sides are necessary here. Even though this is Tum'ah, even though this is not good for us, they can still be around for some other reason. Okay. So, a Jew who nonetheless dresses himself up with garments or deeds or eats those things that are prohibited to him, will lower his level of Kedushah that he intrinsically has. And if he chooses to put on the garments of Torah mitzvot, he will elevate himself. So here what happens is something very interesting. He explained to us, the Balatanya before, that the Levushim are more important than the Nefesh, Eiloki. How could that be? Because what are the Levushim, Torah mitzvot? If that Nefesh performed Torah mitzvot, it has become more elevated. Right? So therefore, the Torah mitzvot, the levushim, are in some ways higher than the, than the actual nefesh. They elevate it. They become a part of it, and they elevate it. Whereas the klipot, the three bad klipot, not klipot noga, right? they're very bad. They're completely bad. And there, what happens is that if somebody puts on those levushim, he actually can go lower. Here, it, you have the opposite. You actually can go higher. And these levushim are higher. Whereas there, through the levushim, one can go lower. Lower and lower. It means a person that is on that side, by doing the wrong thing, can actually become worse and worse and worse. The best way to understand this is with what the rabbis tell us about the various gates of Tumah. You've heard of the 50th gate, supposedly, that's the lowest one. That's the level of the gate of heresy. And once you reach that level, it's very, very hard to come out. It's like quicksand, even worse than quicksand. You can't get out of it. You can't escape from it so easily. All right. Just getting back to what we were saying before, that this side of the Tumah has 10 sefirot as well. The 10 sefirot are described in the Zohar, and he brings them down in this chapter, as ketarim, as crowns of Tumah. It's a Kabbalistic concept. Why are they called crowns? Why are the sefirot called crowns? That's maybe for another time we'll discuss that. Just perhaps remember that a crown gives a certain kavod. It's also a certain levush. You put it on. Okay? So in some way, it does fit the the idea that's being taught over here. What is this koach, whether it's the Ktusha or the Tuma attempting to do? All right. The crowns of Tuma consists of ten, right? We said three are intellectual and seven are midot raot, the bad midot. Just to give you three examples, what could be a bad midah? or the opposite of a good midah when it comes to the sefirot. So let's take, let's take chesed. Chesed means kindness. What's the opposite? What would be a bad midah? Remember, we're having 10 that correspond to the, to the bad, 10 that are opposite Selfish of the good. Selfishness. Huh? Selfishness. Tava, desire. Desire is the bad midah of chesed. Gevura which is severity, fear of Hashem. The bad midah of Gevura is chaos, is anger. 
the bat midah of tiferet, of beauty, of splendor, is gava, is arrogance. These are just examples of the various midot raot, the bad midot, that stem or are expressed through these various uh, sefirot on, on the other side, on the side of the tumah. He further explains that the way this works is because midot, spiritual midot, that a character is spiritual, it's not something physical, is based or formed through yesodot raim. The bad midot are formed from bad elements, negative elements. In other words, the same way that the physical body, that which is physical in nature, is, consists of elements, remember, water, earth, fire, and air, the spiritual neshama, the spiritual nefesh, also consists of yesodot, but they are spiritual. But however, don't forget that the one that actually generates the midot is the sechel. The sechel is really not, not, not so much what the one that generates, but as he explains, molid, molid et midot. Everything comes from the sechel, from the mind. The sechel is the shorish of the midot. Even though the midot are emotional and more connected to the body than to the sechel, but the sechel has the ability to channel them properly, to direct them. So that's why he, the Sechel is called the Mekor. The Chokhmah Binavadat is the Mekor, the source, the Shoresh, the root of the Midot. Malatanya goes on to explain in Perek Vav as follows. This Sechel, however, sometimes is so small, limited, like a little child. Now, where do you see the difference between a small Sechel and a big Sechel? A small sechel of an immature child emphasizes that which is small, little toys. And when he gets angry, he gets angry for what? For small things. And if he's gava, for small, silly things. Oh, I see. You see how the sechel will ultimately de determine how this individual ex expresses himself, how he deals with the world his ma'asim, does he emphasize that which is small or that which is important and big? Is he mature or not? The sechel of a small, immature child cannot appreciate that which is great and important. It just doesn't have that ability. It doesn't have to be a child. There are a lot of adults who have the sechel of a child by, by what they emphasize. What's a priority to them? What is meaningful to them? Don't think that this is just some people. How many people emphasize big weddings, even though they don't have the money? I'm not talking about somebody that has $500 million and he wants to impact the whole city. Fine, that's his kavod. He's entitled to do that. But what about if somebody wants to make a big wedding just to show off? It's a small mind. He doesn't realize that this money that you're spending in the wedding could be used for better, more important things in life, greater accomplishments. People will forget what they ate. <laughs> what are you doing it for? Just to show off? That's so small of a sechel. A lot of people, of course, feel the pressure. But still, it's still a small sechel. So that's just an example of how one can use his sechel in a positive way or in a negative way, depending on what he emphasizes. But in reality, the sechel is not just the one that directs the midot. The sechel, depending on how, uh, on how it expresses itself, or what it favors, or what it prefers, will actually tell us, will be indicative of whether this is a big sechel or a small sechel. In other words, it's not just that the choices it makes will have consequences. It's not just about choosing the right or the wrong things. We can actually tell a lot about the person and about his sechel but what, by what he has chosen. Follow me? It will ultimately tell us more than anything else who this individual is. The Balatanya continues on to say, therefore, when the sechel, or actually the whole nefesh abehemi, chooses the dvarim chooses the wrong things, the impure things, 
his entire essence, his entire body, all his levushim and all his organs are becoming levushim for the Tumah. They're actually helping the Tumah. I have a whole lecture about, about this in dealing with intermarriage. What do you do when you combine two individuals with opposite purposes, both good individuals, it has nothing to do with good and bad, two people with completely different destinies together, a Jew and a non-Jew. The Jew does not realize that as, as good as this non-Jew may be, and there are so many good non-Jews, nonetheless the marriage, unless the non-Jew converts, okay, unless they convert, that marriage is taking Kedusha and giving it over to the Tum'ah. You are feeding that side. You're giving ammunition to the other side. You can't have them both. You're either weakening yourself and your mission, or strengthening that mission, depending exactly on what that individual is, that other one. Still, it's, it's wrong, not because it doesn't work uh, in uh, getting along. The two people, two human beings, decent, can get along. But the missions are different. People don't understand and appreciate that the Jew has a mission, a tremendous responsibility, and he has to protect himself. We have nothing against others who have a different mission. We can't mix. We can't mix oil with water. That's it. So, w when one dresses himself up with Tumah, with Levushim of Tumah, he's basically empowering the Tumah too. As we've explained before, the Tumah gets its nourishment from sins. That side which is opposed to God, the ones, I'm talking about the ones who are opposed to God and divinity, can become more powerful as a result of sinners, or can become weak as a result of more and more light in the world, and less darkness, less sins. And how, <clears throat> how one recognizes it? Recognizes what? That he becomes weaker. How does one recognize it? He may not on his own, if he's not learning. If he's mm -hmm. Jewish, if he does not learn, or he has no rabbi or good friend that will tell him, on his own, the only way he will know is if he gets a message from upstairs, a rude awakening, either through a dream, or through something that happens in his life that it makes him stop and think. Otherwise, people just live, work, eat, and they may not stop to think. That's why what happens is that a lot of people, who are not bad necessarily, just end up wasting their life, not doing what they're supposed to, and they have to come back and come back and come back. That's what Gilgul, part of the reincarnation, is all about. Having to come back. You missed. You missed out. Now, sometimes it's not, a, it's not anybody's fault. Let's say somebody grew up in uh, Birobijan. You know where that is? <laughs> you know. And I don't know if they have even a Chabad over there. But he was sent there. And he didn't observe all the mitzvot because there wasn't too much Torah there. But it's not his fault. He was born there. His father went there. When he goes upstairs, he said, you know, you were not a bad person, but you don't have enough merits to go to Gan Eden. We have to send you down, but don't worry. Next time you come down, you're coming down in Bnei Brak or in Meashari. Don't worry, we'll take care of you. It's just like a tree that you bought in the nursery and you spent a hundred dollars for it, a beautiful tree, and you, after planting it, you come back and you say, why is it not growing? You're afraid it's, it's going to die out completely, and you immediately call up the nursery. What did you do? You sold me a bad tree. We didn't sell you a bad tree. Just tell us what you did. Well, I planted it at this corner of my yard. Is there sun? Is there shade? Did you water it? And he says, there's a lot of shade. Well, this tree needs a lot of sun. While it's still young, you can uproot it and you can replant it in the right spot. Once it has grown, it's so hard. You can't uproot it so easily. Mm -hmm. So what does Hashem do? Hashem says, what can I do? You know, the person has lived his life in the wrong place, never uprooted himself when he was young, didn't do Teshuvah. I'll have to do it for him. I'm going to replant him. So therefore, in answer to your question, a lot of people don't ever find out they have to come back. But Hashem is merciful, and anybody who has a parent or a grandparent who prayed that their kids and grandchildren should do the right thing, sometimes it's their merit that awakens the child or grandchild to come back. 
coming back to Torah. Torah and Mitzvot are the Levushim of the Nefesh Eloki, of the Divine Nefesh, including anything that serves the Kedusha. Anything that serves the Kedusha is therefore something positive, something that is a positive garment, I guess you can call it too, with which the nefesh hailoki can dress itself up. A mitzvah, a good deed. That which is not, does not serve the kedusha, it could be anything, even if it's not an avera, it's just, as he calls it, hevel, all the vanities of this world. If you do something which is not a sin, but it's not a mitzvah, it's parve, it's neutral. If, it, if it's neutral, and does not serve the Kedusha, then it more likely than not belongs to the other side. It's, it may be a complete waste of time. A lot of people do things that are not necessarily bad, but a complete waste of time. It doesn't serve the Kedusha. Then it's more likely belongs to the other side. Anything that serves the Kedusha, serves the purpose of life, then belongs with the Kedusha. Otherwise, it belongs to the other side. There's really nothing in between. You can't call yourself, I'm in between. You're either on this side or you're on that side. That is why he explains the Sitra Chara. It's called Sitra Chara in Aramaic, means the other side. It's the other side. It's the other side. It's the side that's opposed. Opposed to doing the divine will. Speaking about the side of Tusha, however, from the side of the Tusha, anybody that is involved in doing that which serves the purpose of, of the divine plan, draws from the Kiddushah, because the Kiddushah extends itself into this world. There's something called Hashra'at HaShekhinah, that the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence of Hashem, dwells. It could dwell on one individual. It could, it could dwell in a home, in a, symbol, in, the, in a synagogue, where there is ten people. The Shekhinah is there. Or even where one individual is learning Torah. He's learning Torah, that means he's serving Hashem then the Shekhinah comes and resides with him. The Kedusha can be drawn to wherever an individual is. Because that's the nature of the Kedusha. The Kedusha extends itself to this world. And we can draw it to where we are, depending on what we do. This one condition. The most important condition for the Kedusha to reside in one's home, or in one, is for him to be mitbatel. And this is a very important part of this chapter. It batlut. There are those who are willing to surrender to Hashem, to do what Hashem expects of them, wants of them, and those who don't want to. That's really what it comes down to. Either you surrender to Him, mit batel, or not. Choose what you want to do, to accept Him or not to accept Him. No, I'm not talking about here perfection right now. We're not perfect. But do we want to? Would we like to? Would we prefer to? That makes a big difference. Some people don't even have the will. There are those who have the will, they just have a hard time carrying it out. Does one want to meet Batel, his Ratzon to the will the Ratzon of Hashem, or not? Guess what happens? In the real world, there's so many who don't want to, and therefore that gives the appearance that this world is not being managed by Hashem. Because there's a certain element of independence in the human being. From the Chet Adam Arishon we learn this. Man wants to be independent of God. Hashem made it so. To give him that ability to want to get away. You can either become close to him, connect to him, or turn away. When you turn away, why are you turning away? Because you want to be independent. So being independent, not being limited by laws, by morality, is what's pushing the nefesh, a behemi, to go to that side. I want to be in that camp. I don't have to live by certain rules of God. It could be subconscious. Not everybody will admit to this. Subconsciously. The sechel, remember the sechel is the one that's making this decision, and the sechel is, is biased. It will not always tell you the truth. But it would rather not believe in a God rather not. To want to believe in a God is more difficult. And therefore the one who's already close to him because of his nefesh and loki obviously still has a challenge but more likely than not will be drawn to it at times. 
at times will be drawn to it. So it, ulti it ultimately depends on whether one is mitbatel or not. Does he surrender to Hashem or not? Whether Hashem will reside with him, be with him. Who surrenders to Hashem? So the Baratan explains there's two types of entities. One is a malach. He says bepoal. In other words, naturally, a malach has no free will. Naturally surrenders to Hashem. And then there's one that bekoach with his own free will, makes a decision. And when do you see it? When a Jew gives his life, al Kiddush Hashem, to rather be killed than to go against his will. That's when you really see the best example of complete surrender, bekoach, not before, because he's not a malach. He doesn't do it automatically. It's bekoach, he has to push himself. That is possible, and especially is seen through the mitzvot of Kiddush Hashem. One who does not surrender himself, however, nifrad mimeno, then he becomes separated from him. What happens when one is separated from Hashem? That which is separated from Hashem, he goes on to explain, does not receive his nourishment, his chayut, his vitality, directly from Hashem. This actual detail that I'm about to explain is a beautiful detail that he elaborates more later on. Very interesting, very interesting idea. How does the world of Tumar receive its nourishment, and how does the world of Kedusha receive its nourishment? In a very, very different way. I'll explain that briefly now. One who is nifrad, one who is distant from Hashem, he's separate from Hashem, does not receive his vitality, his chiyut, from the Kedusha of Hashem. Where does his vitality come from? Something called Meachoraim. In the Kabbalah, there's two ways Hashem gives from what I recall right now. Two. One is from his pnimiyut, from his internal desire to give, and one is from the back end, me'achoraim. When you first read this word, achoraim, you say, wow, achoraim from the back end? What does that mean? But he explains this very, very nicely. In chapter 24, I think that's in chapter 24, he explains that Pnimiyut, what does Pnimiyut mean? Pnimiyut means internally, but it comes from the word Panim. There are times when Hashem gives us with His face. What does that mean? He wants to give it to us. He's glad to give it to us. He does it facing us. And if He's upset, or doesn't like you, or you are distant from Him, He gives it to you without looking at you. Meachoraim, therefore, from the back end means without looking at you. In other words, there's no will, and there's no, desi there's no desire. He's not happy to give it to you. It makes a big difference how we get the chiyut, the vitality from Hashem. That which belongs to the Kedushah, a Kedush who wants for it to have its vitality. Hashem wants it to, to, to survive, and therefore He gives them the vitality from his desire, from his ratzon, from his pnimiyut. The klipot, Hashem would rather not have. He wants them just to enable free will. He created them for that purpose. So they will receive the nourishment from the achoraim. So the klipot receive vitality from the back end, not direct. And there's a big difference between the two of them. We don't have the time. Feels it no, no, no. That he doesn't always feel. Not really. Um, you see, sometimes you can tell. If you're really very perceptive and you analyze a person's wealth, look at wealth as an, as an example, you will be able to figure out maybe that this individual received wealth or whatever, lottery, fortune, whatever, inheritance, either because of his mazal or because of a beracha, or because of a certain deed. If you analyze his life, you may be able to detect where does this come from? Is this a beracha? Maybe it's a punishment. As Shalom Melech says, sometimes wealth, shamul lebaalav lera'ato, this will be his fall. This money could be a kelalai, a curse. How could you tell? If you look, sometimes you can look at the individual, his life, and see whether what he has is a beracha or not. Maybe it's just a test. Maybe it's part of his mazal. But we don't always know. All we know is that the Kiddushah is closer to Hashem, therefore. Hashem gives it 
the Chiyut, the vitality to it directly. That which is from the Kelipot does not receive its vitality directly. This vitality, however, he explains, goes down to the Kelipot through various Yeridot, various Ishtal Shalut, level after level, constriction after constriction. In other words, it's a very, very minute amount of light. It's a different kind of vitality. And after it comes down, when it does reach its destination, it comes about through Galut. Also a very interesting term that he uses, Galut. Galut means exile. Yes, because that light is grabbed by the impurity as though it is Mishabedoto, as though it is enslaving it. It is not there in a way where it is accepted, subservient to it. I want you. See what I mean? So it's called Nimsa Bikalut. Anything that's in exile has a master. You have a slave, a servant, and a master. You're in exile. So that light, in some way, is taken over. It is not a light where the individual appreciates it, is thankful to it, recognizes it. So it is called a light in Galut. So all that chayut, all that vitality, comes down there. It is not seen. First of all, it is, a, it's, it is concealed, the light of Hashem. But it still needs to be there, because without that vitality, whatever it is would cease to exist. Nothing in this world can exist without the vitality of Hashem. So even though it's there, it's begalut. In other words, it's not the same. It's not being experienced the same way as if it would be on the side of the Kedusha, where it would be much more noticeable, either through the Ashgachah of Hashem, through miracles, or through many ways. He does not get into that, how one can see. Because in the, in, as it is, the light is somewhat concealed, as it is. But in the Tuma, it is even more concealed. You know why? Because it's a Ra. You see, why is this person so evil, sinful, and so prosperous? That prosperity is vitality. Right? We don't know. We don't know Hashem's reason in Hashem. All we know is that it's there. It's somewhat concealed. It could be Me'achoraim. It's coming from the back end. It's not coming direct. But it's then, nonetheless, it's there. It has to be there for whatever reason. Just to finish up, he says, now you understand why this world is called Olam Kalipot, Olam Asitra Achara, this physical world, Olam HaAsiya, is called the world of Kalipot because that's all we see. We see a lot of the impurities. We see a lot of Ra. We see that the Rishayim apparently are so successful in committing all these atrocities and all these wars. What's going on? Look at how much war, how much murder, how much sin. Throughout history, all the civilizations, Olam HaKlipot, a world of Klipot, a world that gives the appearance as though they're independent of God. People have asked the question, where was God in the Holocaust? Because that's the appearance that they get. Where is God? <laughs> Obviously, the fact that some survived, you can see that God was there. You can also see the fact that Hashem allowed this to happen, that obviously for some reason He let them loose. There's a lot of ways where you can see, but the appearance is as though people are independent. They're doing what they want, even though they're really not. And the reason why it doesn't appear that God is involved is because so many people are not surrendering. A lot of people are not surrendering to the will of Hashem. So you, can, you think that this is the world of Kalipot. But it's, it's really not. But that's the way it's called, because of the appearance. He finishes up the Perek as follows, with the following note. Even though the Or and Sof, the light of the En Sof, permeates this world, the physical world, Olam Asiyah, with all the Sefirot of the various other worlds, Abiyah, right? We have Atzilut. We have Bria, we have Yitzira, we have Asiya. The Or and Sof, which is all the way on top, comes down through all these worlds and permeates this world. So even though it has arrived and it's here and it interacts with this world, despite that, this is still a world where so much is 
opposed to that. So much does not want him. He's not welcome in many, many quarters. The last clipot, however, the lower clipot, the three clipot, he reminds us are mentioned, the remes in Yechezkel. For those of you who want to look it up, in the first chapter of Yechezkel, when he describes the divine chariot, he says that he saw a ruach se'ara anan gadol ve'esh mitlakahat. He saw a storm, a big cloud, and a fire, burning fire. These three are the names used to describe those three klipot temeot legamre, the ones the ones that are completely unclean. And from these three klipot is where the nefashot of the non-Jewish world and those animals that are forbidden for us to eat stem from. And was there's different kinds of neshamot, different kinds of nefashot. There are some that come from an area that's more divine and some that are from the other side. So all those things that are forbidden for us to eat, including the, the nefashot of the non-Jewish world, belongs or comes from that side. So even though a nefesh is a, a, a spiritual entity, remember from what we said in the beginning, there are two sides. The two sides Hashem wanted to, to exist. The two sides serve a purpose. Okay, we're not talking about good and bad right now. We're talking about something that Hashem wants. They ju they're just different. And they, come from, they come from different sides. And those negative commandments, the 365 negative commandments, also belongs to that side. Which means that any deed that is performed, any wrong deed, is receiving its nourishment, its push, its vitality from that side. Something that is good and beautiful and holy is drawing its vitality from the Tzadak Dusha, from the, from the holy side. Just to finish, just want to point out that look how powerful the Sechel is. The Sechel, the mind, versus the Nefesh HaBehemi in its natural state. Natural state meaning that it expresses its desires in a natural way, without thinking. It's automatic almost. Nefesh Abemi has natural instincts and desires without giving it too much thought. Whereas the Sechem really is where the choices are. Hashem has given the human being a Sechel, regardless of which side he comes from. Use your brains. Use your sechel, your chokhmah, binavadat, because that is a vessel which can analyze. That is a vessel that can look at creation. That is a vessel that can know God, if it chooses to. And that vessel, the sechel, is the one that can direct the midot, can direct one's character and nature to become a refined person or not. So regardless of which mitzvot a person does, which good deeds he chooses to do, Regardless of all that, we're not going to talk about now means what, but <coughs> refinement of character, being a better person, a more decent human being, that is within the means and the capacity of every human being that was created in the image of Hashem. How? Through that sechel that has the ability to make the decisions. Hopefully it will make the proper decisions, because it is a sechel that will ultimately determine the midot. Will I get angry or not? Will I covet or not? Will I be kind or not? Who, des who decides? Desires we have naturally, but who makes the final decision? Don't ever, don't ever say, I was born like this. People claim I was born like that. This is the way I am. Take me, accept me the way I am. No, there's no such thing. Whether it's the man singer or the woman or the child, regardless. Yes, you may have inclinations. These are natural. Yes, some have this one more than another. The, the different kinds of inclinations. But you have a sechel, you have free will. You're endowed with that ability to make decisions. In Bezat Hashem, if you use that sechel properly, that sechel will direct your midot to do the right things. Okay.